Good morning. Good to see all of you. Welcome. Glad that you're here. Uh, those that we can see, but also those who uh, are joining us online, it's good to have you here with us um, as well. Dr. Poirier, my esteemed colleague in pastoral theology, uh, we have the opportunity uh, to hear from him this morning as he preaches for us. And though we're, uh, I guess, about three weeks into the semester now, we, this morning, begin our regular chapel series. And the question that's guiding us throughout the semester is a question that's asked in Psalm 8, which will be part of our order of worship this morning. Eddie Pune will be reading that for us. What is man that you are mindful of him? And so we'll be addressing uh, issues throughout the semester uh, related to the doctrine of humanity. Uh, as I said, Eddie, uh, one of our graduating students this May, uh, Lord willing, uh, will be assisting us in worship this morning. Just a couple of announcements. These are more reminders. Uh, just remember that prayer groups um, are immediately following chapel. Those start at, at 12 noon, followed by community lunch at 12.30. And again, if you're in a mentor uh, group, you can go and grab some lunch after uh, your prayer group and take that to wherever your designated location is. Well, let's uh, stand for our call to worship. This passage I'll read for us. What is man? What is the chief end of man? Surely uh, most of you, if not all of you, have that Answer memorized from the Westminster Shorter Catechism. What is the chief end of man? Man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. And that's expressed in our call to worship, the opening verses of Psalm 92. So let's hear God's word together. It is good to praise the Lord and make music to your name, O Most High, to proclaim your love in the morning and your faithfulness at night to the music of the ten-stringed lyre and the melody of the harp. For you make me glad by your deeds, O Lord. I sing for joy at the works of your hands. How great are your works, O Lord. How profound your thoughts. Let's pray together. O Lord, we come confessing how different our view of good, our view of the good life is, from what we read in your word, even from what we read in this psalm. And so would you, we ask, in the power of your spirit, applying to us the merits of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, realign our hearts to your purpose for our lives, that we might live in all things for the glory of your great name, we pray. Amen. Let's remain standing and uh, take your Trinity hymnals and turn to page 111 and we will sing together, This is My Father's World. This is my Father's world and to my listening
continue now in our worship with a responsive reading from Psalm 8. You'll find it there in your handout. I'll read the light print. Please respond and join me in the bold. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babies and infants, you have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens, and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the seas. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. We've just spoken of an incredible wonder that the Lord of the universe would pay mind to us, even to the details of our lives. And yet we find that the details of our lives have not been all that worthy of his majesty. We are full of sin. But friends, Christ is full of mercy, and he bids us come to him in confession. So we move to do that now using the prayer printed there the handout. Please join me now as we confess our sins together. Father in heaven, forgive us for not seeing our need for you, for not mourning about the things that grieve you, for not believing that you give us far better than we deserve, for not hungering and thirsting for the world to be restored, for not showing mercy to those in need, for not seeking you with singleness of heart, for not pursuing peace in our relationships, for not taking a stand for you and your people, even when it hurts. Father, forgive us and help us to be kingdom-minded people. Amen. Friends, we bow our hearts in confession, but we raise them up to hear good news. Please stand with me now if you're able as we hear God's assurance of our pardon and the promise of renewal from Ezekiel 36. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh and I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. You will be my people, and I will be your God. Amen. Please uh, turn to your handout now. Um, If you are a woman and you know this song, you know that there should be an extra line on the bridge. I'll be singing that line. It goes, let your glory fill the earth. You can follow me if you'd like to sing that part along with the men's part. (laughs) 
Who has held the oceans in his hand? Who has numbered every grain of sand? Days and nations tremble at his voice. All creation rises to to the Lord who can question any of his words who can teach the one who knows all things who can fathom all his wondrous deeds Behold our God seated on his throne come let us adore seated. As Rob said, uh, we're starting a series on uh, what is man. And it reminded me of a conference I went to of Reformed people. About a thousand people were in attendance. And the keynote speaker actually started his talk with that question, he said uh, to all of us, what is man? What's the nature of man? And to a man, we all shouted back, totally depraved, nailed it. We got our A, or so we thought. With a quizzical look on his face, he replied, really? Is that where you begin? Where does God begin? And with egg all over our faces, we realized, oh, we had really missed it. We, we thought we knew our Reformed theology, but we didn't. Uh, we failed to give the biblical answer. 
Now, it is true that after Adam's fall, all of us are born in original sin. We are totally depraved. But when God begins to speak to us, that's not where he begins. He begins in Genesis 1. He tells us who we really are. He begins by telling us how he created all things, all very good, and in particular, he created man, male and female, in his own image. And though we are fallen in Adam, God now is redeeming us to the second Adam, through Jesus Christ, transforming us, think of this, transforming you into his image, the image of Jesus Christ. It's that fundamental truth that I want to focus our attention on today, that we may love the Lord better, to love one another better, and to proclaim uh, this gospel to a a world of men and women and boys and girls um, who are told all the time, every day, something quite different. So I'm going to read a few passages from Genesis 1, verse 1, verse 24 through 28, and verse 30. Here now, this is the word of the living God. Verse 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Verse 24, and God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds, livestock and creeping things, and beasts of the earth according to their kinds. And it was so. And God made the beasts of the earth according to their kinds and the livestock according to their kinds and everything that creeps on the ground according to its kind. And God saw it was good. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Verse 31, and God saw everything he had made. Behold, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning, the sixth day. So ends the reading of God's word. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, by your spirit, you wrote these words to testify about who you are as our creator, and who we are as your creatures created in your image. May you now, through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, who is seated at your right hand, restore to us and in us your truth, your image. Amen. Two main things I want to do today. I want to ask the same question and give the two kinds of answers. What is man, first? How does the world answer? And then what is man? How does God answer? So first, what is man? What is the world? How does the world answer that? Well, listen to one of the world's high priests. The cosmos is all that is or was or ever will be. That's how the world answers a clear example of idolatry of what Paul says in Romans 1.25. They exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served created things rather than the creator who is forever to be praised. That lie goes by a legion of names. One of them is naturalism, naturism. Nature is all there is. And that's all you are, the world claims. And that means that all your dreams and desires Your loves, your deceits, your rancor, your hates are reduced to mere matter in motion without purpose, period. That's the message the world brings to you and I, to our spouses, to our friends, to our children, to our children's children. 
A few years back, the London Zoo offered a provocative exhibit. There was a large sign on one of the cages, and it read, warning humans in their natural environment. That's right. For several days, the London Zoo featured men and women. They were dressed, <laughs> but in a cage exhibited at their zoo. And there was a little girl watching who asked her mother, why are there people in there? Why are there people in there? That's a good question. She was asking, is that who I am? Is that all I am? Just an animal. Go to DC, visit the Smithsonian Museum of Natural History. They too will ask the question, what does it mean to be human? And there you'll see what they say. Humans are primates. Humans share more DNA with lemurs, monkeys, and apes than they do with other mammals. Is that all we are? Is that all you are? That's the lie that is shaping and has been shaping our world. And think of the ramifications that, of that when the society preaches that again and again and again. There's a well-known actress, Scarlett Johansson. She has got that message and she says, humans are merely biological organisms and therefore the practice of monogamy, being sexually faithful to one person, is just not natural. I don't think, uh, I do think on some basic level, we are animals. And by instinct, we kind of breed accordingly. She got the message, she connected the dots. She later got married. I wonder if she thought, oh, I'm gonna breed now. Hmm. And is not man or mere animal assumed in the movies we watch, in the music we listen to, the gratuitous violence, the filthy sexual immorality, the vile language and behavior, the constant demeaning of one another, talking about men and women as mere objects to use for one's pleasure. And it's just not on the screens or in our ears. It's on our streets and in our homes. Does the name Ray Rice mean anything to you? In December of 2023, before the game with Miami, the Baltimore Ravens honored Ray. Uh, <clears throat> he was one of their stellar uh, running backs. And yet, this honor came with a bit of controversy. You see, 10 years earlier, what ended his career was a hotel video of him punching his fiance in the elevator, knocking her down, and then dragging her body out of the elevator. The video went viral. He was arrested, eventually dismissed from the NFL. Everybody was burning with anger. But few asked why. If we're animals, why are we angry? On what basis are we upset? Listen, if we're just animals, as our professors and naturalist scientists tell us, then what took place in that elevator? Well, it was just a typical day in the jungle, mere animal behavior. Think of it. When a neighbor's dog, big dog, beats up a smaller dog, do you call family services? When an eagle pounces on a rabbit and begins to devour it, do you call the domestic abuse line? Do you call even the police? Uh, of course we don't. They're just animals. They're only doing what's natural. So why do we censure Ray? There's something in us, though, that says there is a difference. You see, that's the lie of naturalism. It took hold even of Darwin. Have you ever heard of Darwin's constant, horrid doubt? 
He speaks about it in a letter on July 3rd, 1881 to uh, William Graham, and he shares this constant horror. He says, with me, the horrid doubt always arises whether the conviction of man's mind developed from minds of the lower animals are of any value or is at all trustworthy. Would anyone trust in the convictions of a monkey's mind if there are any convictions in such a mind? You sense his horror? You see, <laughs> he, he tells the lie and then the lie faces him back and he realizes that if our minds are just monkey minds, those are his words, then we have no basis to trust even our own thoughts, not even to trust the thought that men are merely animals. That's the lie of naturalism. In the end, naturalism murders man. Yet somehow, in some way, every one of us knows we're not animals. We know Ray Rice was wrong. We know Scarlett Johansson is wrong. We know the Smithsonian is wrong. We know the London Zoo is wrong. We may have difficulty explaining why they're wrong, but we know it. Our Lord Jesus warns us in Matthew, because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. And that's where naturalism leads us. Paul the Apostle tells young Pastor Timothy, very much the same, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness but denying its power have nothing to do with such people. So what is Timothy supposed to do in such an age? What are you going to do? Well, a few sentences later, Paul tells us, and as he told Timothy, this is what to do. As for you, he says, continue in what you have learned from infancy, the scriptures that make you wise to salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. That's why we're here. That's why Westminster is here. Brothers and sisters, <clears throat> that's why we must study the word of God. And we must commit ourselves to proclaim it clearly in the face of the lie of naturalism. The glorious truth that God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit created us in his own image. Well, if that's how the world answers, let's listen to what God says. God's word begins not with man nor nature, but with God. In the beginning, God. So simple. Our, our little children know that. How profound, though. How profound. Man's natural environment, to use the London Zoo language, is God. God's created world. Ours is and always is a God-created, God-governed, God-supported, God-directed world. As the hymn we just sang, didn't we sing? This is my father's world. This is my father's world. Do you remember when you got converted? When I got converted, I was in San Diego, Coronado Beach, looking at a sunset and thinking, oh my goodness, <laughs> for the first time, looking at this beautiful creation, going, this is my father's world. I had suppressed that truth for so long. This is my father's world. Does God say anything more? Two things. He tells us that he specially created us and he created us special. He specially created man. Look at verse 26. There's this abrupt change. Prior to verse 26, 
God creates by a simple fiat. Let it be. Let there be. Let there be light. Verse 11, let the earth sprout vegetation. Verse 20, let the earth, uh, waters swarm with living creatures. Verse 24, let the earth bring forth living creatures. But all that changes, doesn't it? When we come to verse 26. Verse 26, you're ready to hear, let, and he says, let, not let there be, but let us make. Let us make. God specially makes his creatures. He pauses, as it were, considers within himself, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, takes due consideration of this special creature that he is making. Now it's true in Genesis 2-7 that God would make Adam first from the dust of the ground and breathe into his nostrils the breath of life. Later, he would put him in his sleep and he would make Eve from Adam's side, Adam's rib. Indeed, you and I are dust, and to dust we shall return. But remember what this is saying. It's saying you're more than dust, much more. What more? Well, that's the second truth. God not only specially created us, he created us special. Look again. Then God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness. That's the more. And lest we forget it, he kind of rings a bell in verse 27. And God created man in his own image, ring. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Created, created, created. No other creature is created in the image of God. Not the birds. I love birds, but not the birds. Not the fish, not the dolphins, not the monkeys, none of them. None are created in God's image, but man and man alone, male and female. And that means everyone. Whatever cultural, racial, or social distinctions may seem to divide us, we are one. We are united because we are all human beings created in God's image. And he brings that truth home in another way. In verse 26, prior to verse 26, he's been telling us of how he's calling forth the birds and the fish and the animals, right? And he always says, according to their kind, according to their kind, 10 times in Genesis 1, three times, in verse 25, just before verse 26. Listen to 25. And God made the beasts of the earth according to their kinds, and the livestock according to their kinds, and everything that creeps on the ground according to its kind. And God saw it was all very good. You see what God is doing? He's making everything according to a particular pattern, a model. And they're all taken up to this point from the earth. But when God gets to man, he doesn't say, and I'm going to make man according to his kind, but he says, let us make man in our image, in our likeness. The pattern, the exemplar, is not from earth, but from heaven, from God himself. Man is patterned after God himself. And this is true, as we know, even after the fall, Brandon's writing a, Dr. Brandon is writing a commentary on, on James. <laughs> and uh, James 3.9 says what? From our mouths will bless and from our mouths will curse man made in God's image. Even after the fall, however ruined our royalty is, every person we meet is made in God's image. Did you notice how the world, though, speaks of us? How it always directs our heads and our eyes downward? Trudy and I love nature shows, National Geographic. But we have to be on our guard. Got to have Genesis 1 with us. Because the camera always points. You know, it points to the baboons. And the voiceover says, just as 
baboons cuddle their children, so humans cuddle their children. The world always directs us downwards, right? Did you notice how Genesis 1 lifts our eyes, lifts our direction, lifts our faces upward? Who are you? You are made in the image of God. You are made in my image, says the Lord. I think of modern naturalists as dressmakers to a bride who only can see the dress, not the bride. They fail to see the bride. They don't see man, they just see the dust, his dress, but not so God. When God looks at you, believer or unbeliever, he looks at you as made in his image. That's why he sought you. He ran after you, grabbed you, and he converted you through his son, Jesus. You're not nothing. You're made in the image of God. Now let's ask, what does that mean? Well, likeness means that man is like God, but not God. That's always good to know, right? <laughs> We're not God, but we are like God. Image means we reflect God. And I think, think of being in the image of God as like an angled mirror. We reflect God in, in two ways. We first reflect back to God all his glory, his goodness, his truth, his holiness, his justice. That's we, what we reflect back to God, his love. And that reflecting back is really what it means to be a covenantal creature. That would just be another way of saying a co we're covenantal creatures. God made us, and he made us for himself. Voss, in his dogmatics, I love what he says. He says, that man bears God's image means, above all, that he is despised. He is disposed for communion with God. Let me say that again. I stumbled on my words there. Look. That man bears God's image means above all, whatever you think that image is, above all, that man is disposed for communion with God. Wow. God wants to commune with you. God wants to talk to you. And any of us who have been a father or mother knows that. There's something in us that when we have a child, we, I want, I want to call my girls. I want to hear what they've said. If they call their mom, I say, Trudy, what, what did Sarah say? What did Sonia say? What did Anya say? Fathers love to commune with their children. How much more? our Father, who made this world. Secondly, we reflect God's image to others. Not only back to God, but he wants us to reflect his image, his goodness, his love, his truth, his justice to others. Remember what our Lord said right after the Beatitudes? He says, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and do what? Praise your Father in heaven. So let me ask two questions. Do you know who you really are? Do you know that God made you in his own image? Or do you feel a bit swallowed up and insignificant, a bit lost in this vast world? David did. Psalm 8, when I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and stars that you set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him? The son of man that you care for him. But David knew that size doesn't equate with significance. Sometimes Trudy and I will go outside and watch the stars and I'll try to, you know, I know that times, 
she might herself feel insignificant. And it's just the pastor's heart in me. I'll just wisely turn and look down at her and say, Trudy, never forget this. Size doesn't equate with intelligence. And she'll look up at me and smile and says, honey, I know that very well. (laughs) All humor aside, the world argues otherwise. The world says you're just a gnat, a piece of dust on a pale blue dot. Not so. As David goes on to say, you made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. That's the first great truth. Do you know it about yourself? Right? Do you know this about yourself? And then secondly, do you know it about others? C.S. Lewis, in a very famous sermon of his called The Weight of Glory, reminds us there are no ordinary people. You've never talked to a mere mortal. Nations, cultures, arts, civilizations, these are mortal. And their life is to ours as the life of a gnat. But it is immortals we joke with, work with, marry, snub, and exploit. Immortal horrors, thinking of the end, or everlasting splendors. Next time, those of you that have children, hold your baby. Think of that. They're immortal. Whatever you make, your little baby is immortal. Your little girl, your little boy. For those that you are married, next time you're talking to your spouse and getting a little riled up, stop. Right? Shut yourself down and say, He's immortal. She's immortal. Everything around us, all the institutions, all the nations, all the civilizations, all the monuments to those civilizations that we, we prize, they are the life of a gnat. But the people you study with, you pray with, you worship with, you get in debates with, you love or you hate, they're immortal forever and ever. So think about that the next time you engage a roommate or classmate, a friend, a spouse, a sibling, a parent, your brothers and sisters in Christ. It's immortals with whom we walk day in and day out. Why then don't we wake up to that truth, these great truths? Why is it in every day we start and say, this is my father's world? And we know the answer, don't we, friends? Sin. Adam's sin, my sin, your sin, our sin. Sin cast a dark veil upon our world. Sin sits like a black fog that has settled upon our houses, in our homes, in our hearts. And therefore, we don't acknowledge the glory of God in creating us in his image but it is my father's world. And that's why he sent his son. And that's why the father and son sent the Holy Spirit as our creed declares. For that reason, God who said, let light shine in the darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ, Jesus Christ our Lord. It's in his son, the God man, the heavenly man, the new man who has come to restore you and I, this world, into his own image. And he does it by his life, death, and resurrection. That's why we preach the gospel. That's why we study our Hebrew or study our Greek or our church history, right? That's why, because we want to preach that glorious gospel of who our God is, that we are created in his image. 
So brothers and sisters, let us fix our eyes on Jesus. For it's in his image that he is recreating us. Amen? Amen. Let us pray. Oh, Lord Jesus, sent from the Father and enlightened to us by your Holy Spirit, you are the image of the invisible God. Restore your image in us, in each of us, that we may reflect ever more so brightly your goodness, your truth, your justice, your love and life, your glory, and reflect it into this dying world. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Well, do stand with me. We have a wonderful hymn to conclude. Page 170, Ferris Lord Jesus. Ferris Lord Jesus. bless you with the blessing of our high priest. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and grant you peace. He is remaking you into Christ's image. Amen. Go to your prayer times. Uh, You know where they are and at 1230 uh, grab your lunches. Thank you.